The creature's claw struck Sir Raiden in the breastplate, raising him off the horse and sent him flying. Already I want to change um, this opening sentence, not what's happening, but the way it's described. So let's say it lifted him. The breastplate lifting. All right. Comma wouldn't be bad there either. Creature's claws struck Sir Raiden in the breastplate, lifting him off the horse and sent him flying. And I don't know if I can do the ED here. I think I may have to go ING again. But um, let's say launching him. All right. So a little bit stronger words, a little bit clearer what's happening. And then we'll move into the next sentence. Don't think every sentence is going to require that, but you always want to get your first sentence just right. He hadn't started breathing again before he struck the ground with metal clatter. And let's combine this as a sentence. Skipping across the grassy field like a stone on the southern sea. He stuttered to a stop. No, let me change that. I'm going to make that... So he skipped. Sentence variation is one thing that I have some trouble with. So especially if I'm just going, uh, a lot of times there's too much going on. So, so I got two he's going, uh, and that's not going to work too well. Let's take that he out. I know I just did that, but let's fix it. So back to skipping. All right. I promise I won't spend this much time on every sentence. He hadn't started breathing again when he struck the ground with a metal clatter, skipping across the grassy field like a stone on the southern sea. Let's do a comma. He stuttered to a stop on a rocky bit of ground without that without his plate mail armor would have opened up his back. All right. Raiden sucked in air that burned his lungs. The creature from the eastern stretches failed to crush the young knight's chest plate or the chest underneath, let's say with the first strike, with the first strike, that lets you know that this battle just began. All right, with the first strike, but Raiden was surprised his lungs and heart hadn't burst from impact. Forrester was an impressive war horse. All right, we need to say something about it not having its rider anymore because that could... Um, Oh, we'll just leave it. Forrester was an impressive war horse, even without a rider. Okay, I had I had that in there already. Human warriors in the ongoing conflict were intimidated by her size. The creature, with its bulk and monstrous proportions. Okay, I've switched to the monster here. Say the attacking creature. The attacking creature with its bulk and monstrous proportions, dwarfed the mount. Forrester neighed like a frightened draft horse and sidled toward the still water to the west. All right. Draft horse one. I think that's a compound word, but we'll figure it out later. The monster's hooves quaked the ground as it galloped on two bent legs that could be mutations of a bull. All right, I need to be clearer that the horse and the monster are two different things. I'm going to make this a new paragraph. The attacking creature with its bulk and monstrous proportions dwarfed the mount. Forrester neighed like a frightened draft horse and sidled to the side. Okay. The monster's hooves. Okay, let's say... Leaving the horse behind... The monsters, the monster galloped on its own hooves. And quaked the ground on two bent legs that could be mutations of a bull. This was no natural bowl and no common minotaur either. Raiden rolled to 
rolled from side to side like an overturned turtle. He realized how much his chest hurt when he finally dared to move. He, let me switch that. Okay. Raiden, because the moving came first. Control V. Raiden realized how much his chest hurt when he finally dared to move. Using the sentence structure a few times, so I need to be careful not to overdo it. Rolling from side to side like an overturned turtle. He. He needed to rise or die on his back in this very spot. As he pulled his legs under him, he lumbered to his feet, fighting for balance before he could consider fighting the monster his lord and his new king had sent him to fight. Okay, I used fight twice. Sent him to slay. So they sent him to kill this monster. Raiden suspected this beast barreling down upon him to attack again was meant to look partially human in form, as some monsters did, the ones created by darker gods. There was a was hardly a passing resemblance, though. Flesh rolled over its joints, hiding the kind of muscle required to move that much bulk at that speed. Raiden stood, but found himself as hunched over as the creature still coming. He gripped the hilt of his sword and drew it, drew it free with an effort. As much as he, his frightened mind could wander in that moment, he mused that if he had pulled his sword before being attacked, he surely would have lost it as he bounced across the field. The particular monster he faced on its bull legs and, and hooves had an almost pillowy white fur over the rest of its body up to its twisted face with one ear standing as tall and straight as Raiden's own sword. The other ear flopped to one side and bounced around the creature's shoulders as it charged. Raiden squared his feet and held the sword in front of him to make his own attack. The creature pulled up short, sending clouds of dust into Ra Sir Raiden's metal shell. The monster heaved for breath that blasted the knight in his face. Raiden wore his helmet, but had yet to draw close the face protection. No, that... Not that it would have done any good defending against the hot breath, smelling of rot and rage. He took in the full measure of the angry Hukubulatar towering over him. The Hukubulatar swung bear-like claws that appeared distinctly like the paws of a rabbit. At this scale, Raiden would have preferred a bear or even a large wildcat. The monster roared out a garble of noise that might have been words in some language. Raiden whipped his sword from side to th side, threatening the claws with a scratch as the Hobkubilatar threatened him with disembowelment. The monster finally stood straighter than Raiden had been fooled into thinking it could. The beast reached over the knight's weapon with a level of grace and precision he hadn't prepared for. The claws sliced with care through the leather strap in his helmet and lifted it off before casting the metal aside. Raiden heard it bouncing away, but dared not turn his head to track its course. He'd need to live before he could consider retrieving it. Okay, he'd need to go on living. before he could consider retrieving it. It must have bounced farther than he had had must have bounced farther than he had because he heard it strike several tree trunks. The Hobkuvalatar dodged another couple weak swings and then tore furrows along one of Raiden's cheeks. The knight fell to his back again upon the rocky spot and lost hold lost his hold upon his sword anyway. Instead of finishing him, the Hobkuvalatar turned its mighty back and paced away toward the water once more. Raiden rose even slower than before. His gauntlet felt nothing as he touched the ribbons of his ruined face. The pain was too great for him to feel his own touch and any specifics in the flesh of his cheeks. Before he tried, before he tried for his dropped sword, he pulled off his glove and touched his face with tender bare fingers. It stung, and there were wounds. 
perhaps deep wounds, but it was nothing of the power the creature was capable of. Raiden had seen this this Huba, Hub Kuvalatar in battle before. It could have taken off his head with a single swipe, but it hadn't. Maybe some visage of their former friendship remained. The Hob Kuvalatar reached Forrester, where the horse had retreated to the sands of the shore, but had not yet abandoned its master in this one-on-one -on -one combat. The monster... Okay, let me... Um, He should react to this animal going after his horse. Raiden slurred his words over the blood filling his mouth. That'll do it. Leave him alone. The monster wiped Raiden's blood. Let's say wiped another helping of all right the monster wiped another helping of raiden's blood and a smear across the riding gear on the horse's back the knight neglected to pull his glove back on but snatched up his sword with one gloved hand and one bloody hand one gloved hand and one bloody palm let's say all right he ho hopped to his feet and ran through the field to try to save the innocent animal. The Hobkuvalatar swatted Forrester's rump and the animal ran up the slope along the shore with a bloody claw print on its backside. Raiden stopped still in the grass and watched the animal trot southward. He realized once the mount found its way back to Lord Talon in Shoreview, they would... Okay, this needs to be a comma here because i got a dependent clause they would assume Raiden was dead. Probably not a bad assumption, considering how things were going. Forrester stopped at the top of the hill. It turned a little, but did not fully face the action again. The animal bowed its head as if to crop grass, but then raised it and shook its mane as if losing its, its appetite. Raiden's heart sank at the horse's loyalty, which probably spelled its doom. The Hobkuvalatar turned about too quickly for its size. The monster's hooves drilled deep in the wet sand. It roared again. This time Raiden was sure it was a word. Why? He started to speak, but his breath caught in his throat, and the point of the sword dipped. What's happening? We just put blood in his mouth. He coughed up a bit of the gathering blood from his ruined cheek. All right, there we go. Once we add that in, it needs to stay. The, best, the beast tore away from the sand and parted the thick grasses with a few determined steps. Raiden raised his sword once more, but for what it, for what it was worth, and the beast stopped. It roared again what might have been the word why. My lord, Raiden lost his voice two words in. To any onlooker, it might have seemed the knight addressed the Hobkuvalatar as nobility. How silly that would have looked and sounded under different conditions. He tried again. I'm pledged to Shoreview, and Shoreview was pledged to shore him, the beast accused with a flimmy string of intelligible words. Let's, uh, let's develop the relationship here a little bit. Raiden had heard the beast roar in battle before, but had never spoken to it much in the past. I think they have to have spoken to each other before because of what happens later in the story, but we'll see. I may have to take that line out, but we'll see how it goes. I think it's necessary. Raiden wished they had just been an wished it had just been an angry war once more. That would have been easier. My lord, Lord Talon of Shoreview, has pledged his allegiance to the King of Salstir. I am pledged to serve my lord in all things. Raiden, now the Hobkuvalatar 
seemed at a loss for the end of his sentence. The beast pressed forward another dozen steps, closing the distance by half. Raiden didn't speak, nor did he raise his sword. We both served the king of Shoreham against the villainy and tyranny of the king of Salstir, and not that long ago. The words, especially the multiple syllable words, rolled forth alien upon the Kapkuvlatar's narrow tongue, but they hit the knight's heart with more force than the monstrous claws. Raiden shook his unprotected head. It brought pain and dizziness, but he kept his feet as the gesture brought no answer. The monster took one hooved step after another through the eerie silence of this interrupted battle. You came for me to recruit to the side of your traitor lord or to kill before the next battle? Talon never liked you, Jad. He does not believe you would change sides. The Habkuvalatar took Raiden by his shoulders, and the metal clinked under the monster's grip. He at least recognizes honor, even if he has none. Raiden's sword hovered under the monster's belly, but did not capitalize on the opportunity. Jad, the Habkuvalatar of Shoreham, and loyal to its king to the end, lifted Raiden off his feet and level with the monster's pink-red eyes. You do not even try to defend your lord's honor? Not to you, Raiden said as he hung in the air. Jad roared in the knight's face, blowing his hair back, and then leaned in with buck teeth to tear open the warrior's skull, as he had done with any number of other fighters pledged to the growing empire of Saul Steer. Raiden swiped across with his sword in a limped arm cut that fell almost as an afterthought. The blade was true and parted the soft white fur below the Hopkuvalatar's chin. The beast drew back from its bite and dropped Raiden to his armored back in the grass, blood as red as any human stained blood. Okay, let's make this commas because that'll be a little clearer. Blood as red as any human stained Jad's fur. The monster threw back its head in a wordless roar and dropped all its weight down and forward, concentrating concentrated into its massive claws. The beast tore the thick grass down deep into the rich topsoil in a single strike, but the knight had found his feet and retreated far enough to live. The red rabbit eyes of the Habkuvlatar met the blue eyes of the human fighter, now a creature of the kingdom of Salstir. The monster bounded forward like an oversized rabbit. The... Hmm, let me change that because I already mentioned rabbit eyes. Let's say an oversized jack. I don't know that that's going to carry um, a lot of understanding, but I think it works. The Habkuvlatar was fast with its back hooves, stronger than a bull, stronger than any bull. But young Raiden still dodged with subtle ease and found himself at Jade's flank. Again, the knight did not opt to capitalize. Jad turned about and rose slowly to his full height, casting a shadow over the much smaller knight. Shoreview is the largest fiefdom of the kingdom of Shoreham. All right, let me correct that while I'm here. No longer, Raiden said, not much louder than the breeze between them. We could have fought Salstir to a truce if we had held out a little longer, Jad said, just a little longer. Shoreview... Lord Talon lost much being on the very border of the front. He would have fallen soon, and then Salstir would have run over the rest of Shoreham. Coward, Jad growled, with clear spittle flying from his pale lips. Some of the droplets beaded in the red-stained fur from the only wound Raiden had placed upon his old friend. Now see if they're old friends. His old... Let's say they're allies. That's a little different than uh, ally. Traitor wretches. The blood flowed from the knight's torn cheek. The blood flowing from the knight's torn cheek had turned sticky and cold around Aiden, Raiden's collar and down inside his armor. I wish I wasn't here. Jad flexed his claws and rumbled. I'll help you with your wish. The Habkuvlatar feigned forward and Raiden flinched to the left. Jad spoke again. Are you proud 
Do you consider Talon's switch of kings to be honorable? I serve. I do not second guess. I think you do, Jad said. Perhaps. Raiden leaned forward a bit as he waited for the next word, but the Hobkuvalatar burst forward at him. The knight bolted to the right, but the monster had anticipated that. It was on him and tore a plate away from his left arm, but Raiden still managed to retreat out of the reach an angle away from the next set of claws without losing any more flesh or blood. Jad charged again, and this time Raiden opened the beast's flank. The Hobkuvlatar growled in a tone that Raiden could not place to any natural animal. They clashed as they tore up the mat and matted down the grass of this unclaimed field. Raiden opened a few more wounds upon the monster, turning its fur from white to mottled red and purple. He did not get the better of every strike, but he stayed alive again against, let's say, all right, against a beast who had plowed through dozens of knights in previous battles. All right, Raiden took a moment to glance at his abused armor, dents pressed against his flesh and bones, tears opened through the metal in the shape of oversized claw around the openings the metal let's say had the metal had stressed almost to a snowy white hue in other spots the armor folded over itself and had darkened to black he had no sense that Jad was going going easy on him so Raiden was surprised to still be alive and did not anticipate being able to sustain this forever he considered working his way to the horse up on the hill and riding away as quickly as Forrester could carry. Despite the incentive for the mount to give its all, Raiden knew they would not outpace the Hobkuvlatar very far. Still, he considered it. Thoughts of retreat melted away as Jad caught Sir Raiden with another full blow that lifted him into the air and tumbled him into the shadows along the shore. Even before he halted in the soft mud, he knew his left arm was broken. Maybe not shattered, but probably in more than one place. The arm twisted away from him in a grotesque angle as he stood, and water drained out of the extra holes in his remaining armor. The water running down his body was a little too pink for his liking. Let's say his vision doubled as the pain from his arm filled his world. All right. So that doesn't let him get away with uh, having a broken arm, but everything being fine. He had managed to hold on to his sword this time. Raiden was most surprised by that. Still, for all the good it would do him, as he could not seem to muster the energy to lift his feet from the soft mud, nor could he hoist the broadsword in the grip of his good arm. Raiden stood shin deep in the lapping waves of the southern sea. Jad the, Jad the Hobkuvlatar stalked into the sands. For a moment the beast extended to its full height, showing many shallow wounds bad when you have to interpret your own writing, isn't it? Showing many shallow wounds that still wept blood as red as his own. But the larger creature had to slump over in its hulking pose as Jad heaved for extra breath. Sir Raiden took the moment to survey his ruined field. The damage wasn't very wasn't terrible compared to this ruined field, I'm sorry. The damage wasn't terrible compared to the battles they had shared in the past when they both served the king of the shrinking kingdom of Shoreham together. Long after Raiden was dead and forgotten, uh, let's say would be, because that makes it confusing. Let's try that now. Long after Raiden would be dead and forgotten under the preserving mud, these grasses would grow back over as if nothing of note had ever happened. Let's add here at the end. Nothing of, as if nothing of note had ever happened here. This was the point. This shore, along, this shore along which Raiden would die, having failed to slay a monster he did not hate and wished he could still consider a friend. 
this shore had that no farmer or for generations had bothered to plow was what all this bloodshed was over. Little Shoreham, a kingdom better suited for peace. Let me spell that right. P-E-A-C-E, peace. Better suited for peace, but in a world full of war and monsters was simply in Saul Steer's way. Lord Talon had surrendered his allegiance over a letter, and Raiden had been a creature of Solstir in an instant. This was his punishment for that passive betrayal. Jad broke... Okay. He's already broken an arm, so I don't know if I want to use broke again. Jad... Um... Anything violent makes it sound like he's being hit. Jad intruded upon all right there we are jad intruded upon raiden's fevered thoughts by asking why do you think they sent you alone raiden blinked several times and shifted his weight on his cold feet until the bones of his arm hurt too much to move it took him a moment to realize he had not misheard i don't know i think you do i don't jad so stop playing with your food and be done with me spare the horse if any humanity can find root within you um, let's, this should be curse. All right. Curse you for that, Raiden. Cursed indeed, Jad. Cursed to live just long enough to become everything I hate. Be done with it. I think I know Jad. Jad spoke soft. I think Lord Talon does not trust your honor. He has none, so he cannot tolerate when, one with it who has much. He sent you alone to die by my hand. Your loyalty he respects and covets, but your honor reminds him of his own dishonor, so he sends you to die. So do to me what he sent me here for. Your arm is broken badly, Raiden. So it is. Did you happen to bring a Hobkuvalitar doctor with you? The monster drew back its lips in what might have been a smile. There was no telling. If it's not a smile, what would it be? What might have been a smile or a sneer? There was no telling with this species. Clever to the end, but not observant enough. They might be able to set your arm if I got you to, doc to the doctors of the king. Which king, Jad? Spots danced through Raiden's vision as if J Jad kept talking instead of killing. He thought he might fall over on his own and drown in a few inches of water. Okay, if that, that works, okay. I prefer the king of Shoreham because he treated me like a person, Jad the Hopkuvalatar said. I did not think I'd live long enough to see the day anyone ever would. So for that small kindness, I will fight for him until my last blood is spilled or Saul Steer gives up the fight. So finish spilling me, Jad. I'm tired. You'd rather die than serve the king you have loyally defended against against all odds. Since let's say instead of the odds, against all odds up until this day. I am sworn to the Lord I'm sworn to Lord Talon of Shoreview, who is now pledged to the King of Solstir. If dying in this intimate battle puts that to an end well enough. Well then, old friend, Jad said, I'm sure the doctors in Shoreview can set your arm well enough to steer a plow with honor anywhere in the growing kingdom of Solstir. Not well enough to swing a sword as their knight, but after surviving this battle for them, they will have to honor you that with that much. I might rather die, Jad. Well, I'll not be your tool in that, nor will I serve Talon's cowardice by ridding him of a reminder of his honor. Jad turned away and paced through the grasses for the trees. It won't be comfortable, but I believe you can ride back to your lord alive. Let me add something here. Rainy days and cold nights will bring pain like a memory of this day but you will 
survive that too. All right, little uh, dig in there at the end. I'll fall dead along the way. I think you're made of better stuff than that, Jad the Hapkuvlatar stopped by the tree line. He raised his strange voice to be heard by the night at the water's edge. Both the monster's ears perked up almost, almost straight. Just hold tight to Forrester, and the good horse will get you home. Jad turned away and walked through the trees. The top still moved to show the great monster's course long after his bloody fur was hidden below the canopy. Hayden, I'm sorry, Raiden forced one foot in front of the other and made his way up the hill. He dropped his sword trying to climb on the horse's back. He could not get up, and he would not, and he would not bend over to retrieve the weapon. Forrester snorted and lowered himself on the ground to the ground on bent legs. Well, that was kind of you, Raiden whispered. He crawled onto the war horse's back as Forrester climbed let's say back. No. Needs to be up. Climbed up to its full height. Ray as Forrester climbed up to its full height. Let's make that a his. We already mentioned the horse was a a male earlier in the story. As Forrester climbed up to his full height, Raiden cried out because of his jostled arm, but held on with his good. He sweated and shivered from the pain and rising fever. As the horse plodded along the shore, Raiden doubted he'd, he'd make it. Raiden, let's say still doubted. All right, Raiden still doubted he'd make it, but he held on because he had a responsibility to try, even if it, he might never fight again one way or the other. All right, there needs to be a comma there. Almost finished. Raiden thought about the helmet lost in the trees or the sword cast aside in the grass. Someday, one or both would be found. Some child or other traveler would would cast about in their minds coming up with a story to explain such a thing. Let's say such a discovery. Discovery. He imagined there would be no way they would guess the true story. He wished he had the sort of honor he saw in Jad the Hagkuvalatar, or a fraction of the honor the great monster saw in him.